Good morning. This is Ed Maxwell from Nats. We're going to make a short couple of short videos to show you the basic operation of the Hawk Electric Handspec Portable Radio Nuclide Identifier System based on germanium detector. The purpose of this video is to give you a quick overview of how to start and operate the system and also to give you some idea about what is included in the system. This is the Hawk Electric System and helping me is Derika here from our sales department to make this uh, sort of amateur video which we hope will be helpful. This is the Hawk System. If you can focus closer, Derika, come closer. Comes with a 10% coaxial germanium detector. It's got a cryo cooler inside it which is 50 watt rated cooler. 10% germanium coaxial detector means that it has a full size crystal in it. It's not a planar germanium which only allows you a slice of a crystal. It's got a display here in the back which is based on a smartphone, Samsung Galaxy smartphone. It's got interchangeable batteries inside which we will show you shortly. Uh, you can basically turn the thumb screws. It's kind of a little bit of trick. Both of them should be turned vertically while the back panel comes off. And you can see that we've got two batteries in here. One is a 24 volt battery. One is a 12 volt battery. 12 volt battery powers the internal MCA. The 24 volt battery in here, which is the larger battery, it powers the cryo cooler. These are connectors, and this is how you put the cryo cooler on and off. So if you were to change the batteries, you would have to turn off the cryo cooler. You would have to disconnect these cables by pulling on these connectors carefully. Make sure you don't rip the cables apart when you pull them. Uh, that can happen. Pull the big battery out first. And then you would replace it with uh, one of the secondary batteries. We've given you three batteries here. So you have one here, two additional batteries. And what we recommend is that you I'll put this one back. Because this is charged already. Uh, and what you can also do is replace the top battery. It's better to pull this out first. Replace the top battery in here, which is the MCA battery, with one of the smaller batteries. So let me put this back so I don't warm up the detector. Uh, and then you put this clip back, carefully lining up the pins in here. And then the same thing with the larger one. Put this clip back and the try and turn the tri cooler on. The lower part of this device has connections for the Ethernet and the USB port to remotely control the device. It's a little bit of a trick to opening them. You have to have both of these screws lined up vertically. At the same time, you have to pull them at the same time. If you try to pull one at a time, then it doesn't work. It kind of gets stuck. Then you put it back, turn the back screws on. Plug this one back, simply turning the screws back on. Okay, now I just want to give you an overview of what's included. It comes with a Pelican box which carries everything inside it. What we are offering you is one detector inside, two spare detectors for the cryo coolers. They are rated as, uh, they are labeled as battery one, three, and number two is inside right now. And it says 24 volt battery. It comes with a battery charger for 24 volt. And then you have a second MCA battery for 12 volts. One is internal and the second battery is here. And what we recommend is while these batteries are outside, you should keep them charged. You, you charge them basically by connecting these pins. So the 12 volt charger powers up the 12 volt battery. Line up the pins in here with this. It clicks, bring it to an outlet such as this. When you connect it to the outlet, if the battery is not fully charged, it's going to show you amber or yellow or red. If it's fully charged, then it's going to show you a fully green color. The same thing applies to the bigger batteries, except that it uses a different type of a charger, which is the bigger charger. You can make a mistake because this is three pins, those are two pins. Again, you slide the connectors in with a little bit of caution, clicks in, bring them over, connect it to the wall. If it's fully charged, it's going to show this green color, if you can come close. Okay, all right. So if we think we know the batteries, at least one of the batteries fully charged. We don't need to put it in the charger. 
Uh, it's like a computer battery, you can fully charge, disconnect it. But this is how you keep the batteries charged. We also provide you with a 200 watt inverter. That is a 12 volt car inverter that you can plug into your um, cigarette lighter in your car. And by connecting this inverter, you actually have a full 110 out here plus USB. You will have to click it to the inverter plus USB mode and then you'll get this will just become like a 110 volt AC socket and also gives you USB power. You can actually connect this device directly with the with the uh, charging unit and you can run the device um, uninterrupted as long as you want from a car battery. Uh, this is the DC charging unit. It's rated for 110 to 220 volts which means you can literally collect, connect it with uh, European as well as US connectors. It comes with the with the connector cable. Uh, this connector cable is used for charging the device, uh, charging the batteries in the device when your internal batteries are depleted. And it's a little bit of a trick in disconnecting this. It's a screwing mechanism in here. So this cable, one end is a male, another end is a female cable. And then what you have to do is you have to line up these and basically screw it on by holding the internal screw, the, the round one, steady while you fasten the other one and make sure it's snug. If it's not snug, if it's loose, you may try and charge your internal batteries and you'll see your batteries are not charging. And same thing on the other end, if you come from this side, Erika, you can... Uh, this one has the connection port. This one is a little bit more tricky because it's got a smaller angle in here. So what you do is you, if you look inside, if you look inside here, there's a notch. This notch needs to line up with the notch in here. Okay. Okay, I don't think that's going to show up well. Uh, you line up the notch within here. Basically, I have to go over to the other side. I don't have a good grip in here. You can pause for a second. Okay. Once you have those notches lined up, a clips in. That you Wait, hold, hold on. Okay. Once you have the notches lined up, and the, it, it and it, it falls in place, then you hold the rear screw steady while you rotate the external screw to tighten the cable. Right now, we are not charging the batteries. So if you come here, you can see the DC power supply is off. Technically, we are running this from the internal battery that's in the system. Now, the first thing that you do is how to turn on the device and turn on the MCA. We, I like to emphasize that there's a little bit of trick in here. If you turn on the MCA first and the phone, which is the display interface display in here later, then you will go into a demo mode and the demo will not, mode will not allow you to connect to the MCA. So, in order to avoid that, I have, su I have suggested that you turn on the phone first and it's labeled here, okay? And I think you need to come and show the screen from this side. So this is the switch to turn on the phone. You hold it for about a few seconds till the screen lights up. It's basically the screen here, okay? You need to come here, here come on this side. Mm -hmm. Okay, and while that phone is booting up, well, let's show you what happens when you don't turn on the MCA. The MCA power is off here, which is back in here somewhere. This switch in here is off, and now you can see that if I don't turn on the MCA, what's going to happen is the phone's going to boot and come to a demo mode, and it's going to show me uh, uh, just a mock spectrum okay so the phone's booting up and this screen in here is really a demo it's a demo screen you can see it, nothing in here is moving for me to go back into the mode I have to make sure I turn on the MCA 
What I suggest is that you turn on the phone first and while it's booting then you turn on the MCA. Then it's connecting at a device, it's loading all the configuration files and now it's telling me that my detector is cold. Let's go over this menu first if you turn on the lights because the reflection of the lights in here. So, pause for a second. Now that we have booted up and the MCA main screen is on, this is the main screen of the MCA, let's go over the menus. The one here it shows you the, the date and the time. This is the settings menu which is the main menu in here that's telling you are in the settings menu. The snowflake in here shows the detector is cool and the amber USB cable connection in here is very important, not amber, it's green. It shows you that you're connected to the MCA. It's if it's amber or yellow, which means you're not connected to the MCA. Green means you're connected to the MCA. The flashing GPS signal in here means that you're trying to connect to the GPS, but most likely my GPS is off right now or I'm indoors. I'll check on that in a second. And the 100% in here basically shows you the power status of the 12 volt internal MCA battery, not the battery of the phone. What is important in here to look at the battery status of your device is to look at the setting screen and look at the lower left hand corner here. It tells you that the high voltage is off but the power of the MCA is on. The 24 volt battery is providing you 25.97 volts which is still within the limit and the 12 volt battery and is 100% charged and the 12 volt battery is showing you 12.14, uh, 112 which is also 100% charged. So while you're using the device, this is the screen from where you would see the status of your cryocooler battery, which is very important. And if you have the cryocooler battery running out, you're going to see a change in the sound of the cooler. The sound is going to start going down like the fans going off. And at that time, you know that either you have to turn on your DC power supply, which is here, or you have to swap your batteries by doing what we have shown you earlier by taking one of your spare batteries and putting it inside. So right now, everything looks fine. My detector is cold and I'll show you a little bit about what else is included in the, in the settings menu. Basically, it tells you there is a library which is loaded by default, which is the Nuclei Library 1. It tells me that I am now looking at a point source, which is what I'm looking at right now. Distance of the point source is, is generalized to 10 centimeters. My counting mode is live. And again, I can change any of this. My preset count time is 300 seconds. I'm going to change that to a lower count time just for the sake of our test. Make it 30 seconds. Uh, and then it gives you all the parameters. If you want to look at all the parameters of the setting, which has been set earlier, you can see that the ADC channel is 16,000. Lower level discriminator, higher level discriminator, threshold, threshold, pull zero, coarse gain, fine gain, digital offset, input polarity, shaping time, trigger, flat top, and the operating voltage. If you want to change any of these parameters, you would have to have a password access. The default password is 1111 and change them. And if you don't want to worry about setting up all the units, you can either default this to a low counted operation or a high, high counted operation. Then all the parameters is going to fall according to the preset factory settings of a low count rate count or a high count rate count. From this menu, if you're happy with all the settings, you can go back to the back menu, back button, and then you are basically ready to count. What I usually do is I go into the radiometer mode by clicking here, which is the second curved icon on the display here, and then go into the radiometer mode, and then usually what I'm going to see, if my high voltage was turned on, that is going to uh, show me the dose rate information. Now it's showing me almost nothing because my high voltage is turned off. So I have to go back to my settings and in order for me to operate the system, obviously I have to turn on the high voltage. You turn on the high voltage by coming here and clicking the high voltage and then it gives you a message. Are you sure that 18 hours have elapsed since you cooled the detector? We recommend that you cool the detector for about 18 hours, which means that if you're going to start an operation 6 o'clock in the morning, you should start cooling it in the afternoon previous day. And I will turn on the detector, high voltage, give it a few seconds, and then the high voltage uh, bar, green bar is clicked on, and what you can see on the top now, here, that this high voltage sign now indicates that the high voltage is turned on. 
So now I'm, I'm ready to count. But again, I'm going to go back to the radiometer mode. And I'm going to look at the dose information in here and to see if I can find the source. You can see that it's looking at the source and it's telling me, yes, you found a source that's giving me a count rate of around 318 counts. It's got a dose rate of about 0 0.60 microsieverts per hour. Move this source out. Take it out a little bit. Bring in a little bit hotter source in here. The cesium source probably. And you can see that it's a lot hotter source and it's moving on. Now you can see that the sound bar is clicked on but it's not making a sound. In order for me to make a sound, what I have to do is I have to go back in here. Sorry, go to the spectrometer and I have to go to my settings menu and then I have to change this dose alarm rate which is set to a pretty high dose alarm rate of 10 microsieverts to a lower value. So let's say I change it to 0.25 microsieverts per hour. Then I can go to my radiometer mode and now you can see that because my dose rate is set much below the, the detected dose rate of 3.38 microsievert, I am seeing an audio signal. If you can uh, hear the audio signal and this light keeps on flashing on and this flashing light means that, you know, I'm, I'm above the threshold of the dose rate. So that's how you actually go in there and, and, and detect a source. Now, since I have looked at a source and I know that it's detecting radiation, I can go back in here and I can take a spectrum by hitting the spectrum key. Again, show you that settings from the main menu. After you turn the high voltage, go to the spectrum and then you can basically start a spectrum by hitting start. Basically, it shows you all the parameters with which you need to work, which is uh, point source, lifetime. It's asking me to count for 1000 seconds. I'm going to change that to 30. Go to spectrum. I should clear whatever I have in there before and start and start. And you should be able to see the cesium peak right now coming up. It's going to have a high dead time in here because my cesium source is 10 micro curie and I am actually located a little bit too near the detector. Maybe I should just move it away a little bit. Uh, it's very sensitive detector in here. Or what I can do is I can clear this. Uh, I, can, I have to stop, clear, okay, and bring, bring a little bit more reasonable source, which is my cobalt source, which is a little bit less activity. Put it near the detector and then start. I should be able to see. Uh, now you can see the dead time has gone down. The count rate is 357. This is the lifetime. This is the dead time, this is the total count rate, and this is the dose rate. Now while you're counting that, you can toggle between the spectrum mode and the cursor mode by selecting the spectrum or cursor. If you're in the spectrum mode, then what you do is you can see a, a, a blue cursor that pops up, and by positioning the cursor at any location on the screen, I can actually uh, expand on the scale, and I can look more closely. Okay, let's pause the detector. 